Okay. So Disclosure is no longer a consultant for Biomet, but you'll see some pictures come through of, uh, of those fractures. So look, most of the radius fractures are treated non-operatively. We've just heard a number of wonderful talks telling us about how we should treat these and the different methods. But we still have to remember there's a large role for non-operative care in these individuals. Surgery really shouldn't be our first line of treatment. Surgery is what you do when you cannot treat them either with a closed reduction or be able to maintain the closed reduction that you first attained. So let's go over those numbers again. We haven't seen this come through yet, but these are the things that we're looking for on the x-ray. Palmer tilt, normally about 10 to 15 degrees palmer, and we'll accept up to about 10 degrees of dorsal tilt. When we look at radial height and radial inclination, we're really looking about, are we maintaining that radial column, right? That column that we saw earlier in the talks today, or has the whole fragment kind of tipped down into that, uh, into the position of rotation. Ulnar variance is very important because as the radius shortened, but the ulna doesn't, you start to develop that ulnar sided wrist pain, ulnar carpal impaction syndrome. And then finally, articular congruity. Now, there's gap. Two millimeters of gap is going to be better tolerated than two millimeters of step off. I was explaining to patients that's like being at the deli, right? Because when you got the deli slicer going, every time you rub your wrist back and forth across that step off, it's like shearing off another piece of the articular cartilage like at the deli counter. And with time, it's going to cause problems for you. So Whenever we think about non-displaced fractures, it doesn't mean it's always going to be non-displaced. So here's an example of why you have to keep an eye on it. This is a, a woman in her 60s, just the radius fracture. I've known her in the past from when I treated her thumb CMC arthroplasty, arthroplasty. And here she is in September with a relatively non-displaced distal radius fracture. You look at this thing, the volar cortex, oops, sorry about that, volar cortex is well aligned. Um, we say along this relatively neutral tilt, um, looks pretty good. I think she's gonna do just fine. She comes to see me 10 days later, maybe a little more dorsal tilt, but we're still in pretty good position. You put her into a short arm cast. How could this be? How could it fall off? Look, now we have, ah, sorry, hit the wrong buttons, guys. We have a displacement on the carpal impaction. It just reminds you that it's about two to three weeks that fractures of the distal radius can displace. So whether it is a non-displaced fracture or a fracture which you have reduced, you need to follow them into that two to three week period to make sure there isn't displacement. And if there is, you can then come back operatively and take care of it. If you're gonna do a reduction, make sure you have adequate anesthesia. Longitudinal distraction, I think, is an easier way than manually trying to pull it up. It just helps to overcome the muscular spasm, which is present. First, concentrate on reducing that palmar cortex with the hyperextension, and then bring the wrist into a, uh, the fragment rather, into a flex position to pull uh, the distal radius out of its dorsal extended position. Neutralization. We don't want the cotton loader position that's going to cause problems with the nerve, neutral or slight extension. And then there are debate about short arm versus long arm splinting. I think if there's a lot of DRUJ pain, I put them into a sugar tongue so they don't have that pain with rotation. Otherwise, the short arm splints are quite adequate in treating it. Again, loss of reduction, most likely that second week after the reduction or later. So you need to continue to follow the patients at least for two to three weeks to make sure that it isn't gonna fall back out of position. If it didn't work the first time to do a closed reduction, it probably said, go to the relatively simple fractures, probably three to four weeks is enough and place them into a splint afterwards for another couple of weeks. Those that you have to reduce, it takes a little more time for the glue to set, the callus to be firm, and those I tend about to uh, keep immobilized more along a six-week component. So let's look at this one. Elderly individual, you can see the thinning of the cortices telling you there's some osteopenia. This was the initial film. Um, you have to take a really close look to see that there's also a problem with the ulna, right? So there's an ulnar neck fracture here as well. So this is one which can kind of incorporates everything we've been talking about today. Distal radius fracture, palmar tilt to start with, 
We're going to talk more about dorsal comminution, and we see some of that there. So we've got big, strong residents at our place, and the big, strong resident pulls it back out, and it looks like it's in pretty good alignment. So with this post-reduction film, kind of a show of hands, how many people are going to treat this one in a cast? There we go. And how many people are going to take this one to the operating room? Four days later, it looks like this. So what do we see? Maybe a little bit of displacement here of that palmar cortex, but still palmar tilt is present, all is in place. How many people are going to treat this in a cast? How many people are taking this to the operating room? Well, at three weeks, everything's collapsed a little bit. The radius has collapsed. It still maintained its palmar tilt, but with the ulna fracture, the ulna's also collapsed. So we haven't had that concern about the ulna being too long and getting up against the carpus. So here's one where we actually do pretty well with both bones being fractured and both bones being allowed to shorten. And she did just fine being treated in a non-operative fashion. But again, the importance of seeing it at three weeks, right? To know and understand what's happening with the fracture and not get caught six weeks down the road when it's a whole lot more difficult to take care of things. So how do we know? What things can we help to predict whether or not a fracture is going to collapse. Back in 1989, Bill Cooney talked to us about dorsal comminution, particularly past the mid-axial plane, but also dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees and extensive intraarticular involvement. For me, the one thing I always look at is what I call this dorsal flake fracture. So if you see a fracture of the dorsal cortex, which occurs at the diaphyseal metaphyseal region, as well as the metaphyseal epiphyseal region, you know you don't have a whole lot of dorsal cortical support, and those are ones that you're more concerned about falling apart. Le Fontaine, the classic article, and the, the, the components that we look at for displacement, initial dorsal angulation greater than 20 degrees, dorsal comminution, radiocarpal intraarticular involvement, associated ulnar fractures at age greater than 60. And so a fracture like this, which has all those components, is an inherently unstable fracture. And even when you pull it back, is likely to fall back out. This is one that we all would agree needs operative fixation. But Le Fontaine's numbers were these, that you can reduce them. They look great. But then by the time they go back to, to, to actually heal, they've fallen back into the original position from where they were. Now, other studies have come up following this. And, Although a number of different factors come into play, it's, it's still the same. It's the severity of the radial shortening, uh, distal radial shortening followed by dorsal comminution, as well as increasing age and also female sex. Well, the last component really to talk about is the elderly, because there have been a number of papers which come out to say we don't need to do surgery on elderly individuals. They tolerate their displacement well. Where does that come from? Back in 2010, case controlled study, 90 patients over the age of 65, all initially treated with closed reduction and casting. If it displaced, they were offered surgery. If you refuse surgery, then you were treated in a cast, relatively equal number of people. At 24 weeks, right, the operative group had better wrist extension by about six degrees, not really a whole lot. At one year, no difference in dash or pain scores, although grip strength was better in the operative group. 39 compared to 28 pounds at 12 months, no difference in complications. Another study around the same time, 2013, prospective randomized study, 73 patients over the age of 65. All fractures are displaced and unstable and split between reduction in palmar plating versus closed reduction in casting. No difference in range of motion, level of pain um, during the entire one year follow-up. Operative group has better DASH and uh, preview scores at six and 12 weeks, but not six and 12 months. Grip strength better in the operative group at all times by about eight pounds at 12 months. The complications higher in the operative group and most of those were tendonitis from screws being too long. And this led in 2010, the AOS clinical practice guidelines said they're unable to recommend either for or against distal radius fractures in the elderly. Well, I think this study is starting to show that maybe there is a difference. This is a meta-analysis which was published in JHAS in 2019 of 38 clinical trials to treatment of distal radius fractures in adult and elderly patients. And now the pendulum is starting to swing a little bit the other way. That RAF with plate fixation offers results 
that are better both in early and in sustained recovery and in reduction in fracture related complications, mostly stiffness or stiffness in the cast than there is with operative management. So as always, I think this is all about discussion. You need to talk to your patient. You need to talk to the family when you're dealing with the elderly to help you figure out, is this someone who needs to be treated operatively or not? I am dangerously getting close to being considered the elderly. I really don't want, after having spent a year and a half with COVID and not being able to do what I wanna do, to be told that I have to spend now six to 12 months to try to get my wrist motion back and get back to the activities that I was doing before when plate fixation may get me there in a quicker position. If I am infirm, I have other things I'm not doing very much with my life. That may be a different thing, but that's a conversation that we need to have at all. It's not black and white, it's very gray. So finally, most disc radius fractures, we do treat non-operatively, risk of displacement, uh, most highly associated with radial shortening, and please have that conversation with your elderly patients about how to best treat them. Thanks so much.